So let me show you in your notes where we left off. I know I was explaining a lot today, but it's all written for you. Okay? So that's what we went over last time, just our basic material. Okay? Now, here's where I wrote down exactly all the steps of replication in a DNA virus. That's what we just drew on the board. Okay? Attachment penetration. How does it penetrate? That's your options. Okay? If it's enveloped, right, it's got to uncoat. Biosynthesis step, DNA goes to the nucleus, DNA is replicated, right, RNA is made, make your proteins, you mature everything forms, it can release. Here's the nice little picture from your textbook. So just to go through that, all right, even though I drew it in my horrific drawing, here's your DNA virus, it gets in, there's the DNA. DNA goes to the nucleus. You make copies of your DNA. Then you make mRNA. mRNA comes out into the cytoplasm so that the mRNA can make capsid proteins. Capsid proteins go into the nucleus, grab all the viral DNA. Now the virus can leave. That virus is going to now go find a new host cell, go into that host cell. Cycles over and over and over again. Okay. There are five groups or classes of DNA viruses. Okay, and you need to know their names. Okay, because eventually we will get to talk about specific diseases, and we're going to classify the virus by their group names. Okay, the first major class of DNA viruses is called adenoviridae. Okay, all of your adenoviruses are going to infect you through your respiratory system. Okay? They're named adenoviruses because it's very common before these viruses to live in your adenoids. Where are your adenoids? That's your sinuses in the very back of your nasal cavity at the very top of your throat. Okay? They're, prop they're actually really not called adenoids. They're called pharyngeal tonsils. Okay? As you breathe in the particles, they get stuck in those tonsils and start replicating in your body. Okay. Can you think of a virus that may be an adenovirus? The flu is an adenovirus. Common cold, those are adenoviruses. All of those make up adenoviruses. Okay. The second group of DNA viruses is called pox viridae. Basically, any viral infection that you call a pox is going to fit into this group. For it to make a pox, it has to make some sort of raised lesion on your body that is filled with pus. Okay? Examples of pox viridae would be what? Chicken pox, small pox, okay? any of those viruses are going to have, and you may not remember because you were probably young when you had chicken pox, but as you were scratching them chicken pox off of there, there was a pus, a liquid inside of each one of those pox. That's what makes it a pox. Okay? Cows get it too. It's called uh, cowpox. It's really gross looking. Okay. Really big lesions. Okay. Third group, herpes viridae. Instead of forming a pus filled raised lesion on your body, it forms a scabby sore. That if it does that, it's considered a herpes virus. Okay. Most obviously, what virus do you think of would fit into herpes viridae? Herpes, right? Herpes simplex type 1 causes cold sores on the oral or nasal mucosa. Herpes simplex type 2 causes so the same type of sores on your genitals, male or female. Mm -hmm. Well, they are, but they're not fluid filled. So that's what makes the difference is they don't have fluid in them even to begin with. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, let me go ahead and say it before somebody asks me, there is no switching back and forth. That's two completely different viruses. It's just called herpes type 1 and type 2 because the viruses have real similar DNA sequences. They can't hop back and forth. You can't go from your mouth to your genitals. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. Fourth group, Papov, Papovaviridae, hard for me to say. These are your papilloma viruses, a little easier to say. That's what causes warts. Okay? Did you guys know that warts were caused by viruses? 
Yeah, most people don't. And I, I'm sure by now you're all adults. You know that it just, you knew, well, I know it's not really the frog peeing on me. Right? That's probably what your dad told you. But most people have no idea that warts are caused from viruses. That's why you can get a wart and it, if you get it taken off or you cut it off yourself or whatever, it will eventually come back because it's a virus that's living in your body. There's really nothing you can do about it. There's lots of types of warts, too. We're going to talk about them as we get um, into diseases a little later in the semester. Okay. Last group, hepatinaviridae. Again, I don't know why I can't say it. Those are the ones that cause the hepatitis type infections. A lot of those are retroviruses. So it's really hard to classify those as DNA or RNA because they actually start out as RNA and then become DNA. That's what makes them a retrovirus. Okay. Most common thing we're going to talk about that is caused by this group is hepatitis. Okay. What does hepatitis mean? It means liver failure. Regardless of what type of, or liver damage, regardless of what type of hepatitis you get, you're going to see inflammation of the liver. That's why it's called hepatitis. Is all hepatitis deadly? No. Hepatitis A is food poisoning. A lot of you have probably had hepatitis A. And you just didn't know it. It usually doesn't cause any long-term complications. Hep B and Hep C, those are the ones that there's really no cure for. And you're going to deteriorate slowly over time. Okay, we're going to talk about them later. So that's our DNA viruses. Now let's look at what our RNA viruses do. It's written in words for you. But if we look at the picture, I know this one looks a lot more complicated. That's because you have the three different types of RNA viruses. Okay? So we have attachment, penetration, so we have the viral RNA in there. How is it going to work differently? Okay? This first little line right here, this is your negative strand, your antisense. It's going to become double-stranded, make a positive strand, make proteins, Everything will be assembled. Those can lead to infect another cell. If it is a positive strand, still becomes double-stranded just because it prefers to be that way. The sense strand will make the capsid proteins as well as your enzymes you need. Everything gets wrapped up into a nice pretty package and it leaves the cell. Last type is your going to be more of your double-stranded RNAs. Still same thing. RNA is copied. RNA makes the proteins. Everything gets wrapped up in leaves. Okay? Not my favorite picture from your textbook, but it works. Okay? As far as RNA viruses, again, we have five groups. Okay? Now we're going to go over some examples of these a little later. These are not named in a way that's quite as obvious for you to pick out examples. What I want you to do with these is just become familiar with the five groups. Okay? You need to be able to look at these five groups and know that's an RNA virus. That's not a DNA virus. Okay? I've said this when we went through Chapter 12. I'm not going to ask you specific questions about diseases right now. We're just learning about the types of diseases and we'll learn specifics a little later. Okay? So that's what I need you guys to do with those five. You need to be able to recognize them as RNA viruses. So let's do a couple interesting things here at the end of class. Okay. All viruses cause an acute infection. Okay. What does acute mean? No. Acute means short term. Okay. Um, if you go to the um, like acute care or something like that, that means something's wrong with you and you want something to be done about it right now. Okay. So I like, y'all know I like graphs. Okay, so here's our little graph. This graph is showing you over time number of virions, meaning the higher you get up here on the chart, the more viruses you have in your body, the worse you're going to feel, right? Okay, so whenever, let's say I sneeze on you and I give you the flu. You got a certain number of viruses somewhere right here on the graph in your body. Okay, your immune system is going to try to kill those viruses. Okay. So you're going to see a decrease in that original number. You inhaled some. Your immune system tries to kill some of them, but some of them make it past your immune system, go into your cell. Once they've gotten into your cell and they start replicating, then they're going to burst out of your cell 
and you're going to get a huge surge, just all of a sudden this massive increase in the number of viruses you have. This is when you feel the worst. Okay? So day one, day two, day three, day four, usually about on average. Okay? So you're going to start to really feel this. Notice you're sick around day three. Guess what could happen in day one and two? You can infect somebody else. And you would not have any idea that you had the flu. Okay? Once you had the flu and you feel bad, day four, day five, start to feel a little better. Day six, getting better. Day seven, enough of the viral load has decreased, you feel fine. That's a normal viral infection. Okay? There are two groups of viruses. They can do something extra to you. Just give you an extra little surprise. Okay? So let's first look at a latent infection. This word right here. Okay? Let's say I get the chicken pox. I inhale the chicken pox. Okay? My immune system works on it. Uh, then here they come. They release out of my cells. I start to feel bad. I get itchy sores. Feel like I want to die. And then I start to get better. And chicken pox are gone. But since this is a latent infection, the virus never leaves your body. Okay? That virus will lay dormant in your cells, possibly for the rest of your life, and never make you sick again. Okay? But if you're one of the lucky people, once you get months, years down the road, something can happen to stress your immune system. And that chicken pox virus will use that as an opportunity to slowly start growing again. As it slowly starts growing again, the number of viruses in your body increases, increases until you start to feel bad again. Since this was the chicken pox virus in my example, guess what you have when you get to the top of this peak right here? Shingles. Then your immune system will eventually take care of it. The virus load will go back down. And then we can't see the rest of the graph, but it may hang out. No viruses for a while. And then you can get shingles again. That virus can start growing again, and you can get shingles, and then it can go away. Okay? Another latent infection, herpes. Okay? You had a really fun night with somebody. They gave you a present. You had no idea. Your immune system took care of that herpes simplex type 2 virus, and then all of a sudden, days later, surprise, downstairs. Okay? You start getting genital sores. All right? You get more and more of them, you start to feel bad, then those genital sores go away. The herpes sores go away. Does the herpes virus leave your body? Nope. It is with you for the rest of your life. There is no cure. There really, the treatment, all it does is try to keep it in the low level where you don't have an outbreak. Okay? But eventually, again, that herpes will come back to visit you. It will start growing again. You get another set of genital sores. They go away. And you go back down the graph again. Then a little while later, they come to visit you again. And you get more genital sores. Okay? So that's, what, that's one of those things that, yes, HIV is horrific. I agree. But I wouldn't want this either. This is one of those things that's that nice present you get from somebody that you have no idea. Okay? Exactly, and that's, that's what I was about to say. So let's say when you had that fun night with somebody, you inspected them really well. Hey, I recommend that you do. I, I really do. I'm, I'm glad I'm married. You know, don't have to worry about that as much. But you inspect them really well. They don't have a single sore anywhere. They may be in this area where they don't have any sores showing, but do they still have the virus? You can still get a nice little present from them. Okay. There are medications you can take that decrease the numbers a lot, and it makes it less likely to get the infection from somebody, but you can still get it from somebody, and it's never going away once you get it. Okay? All right, that's a latent infection. The other thing that we see sometimes is called a persistent infection. If somebody's really persistent, what does that mean? They're annoying, right? They're always right there just constantly nagging you, okay? The way this works, you get the infection. Immune system takes care of it. starts to grow. You get the initial acute infection, right? 
and then you get better, and then you slowly keep getting worse again. Okay? That virus doesn't just completely go down like a latent infection. It slowly increases its number until it gets to a high enough infection that it can completely overtake your immune system, then grows like crazy. Persistent infections will kill you. Okay? An example of a persistent infection, none of them are going to be just something obvious that, I, that you're going to be real familiar with, like herpes or chicken pox. But uh, do you guys know what the measles are? You know what the measles are, right? Did you have measles? Why not? Because you're vaccinated against it. The reason we vaccinate against the measles is not because the measles will kill you. Here's the measles. You get them, they go away. But the measles is a persistent infection. In some people, after you get this measles outbreak, it's slow. that virus slowly keeps growing in your body, and it moves into your nervous system. And it becomes something called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Fancy word for the measles virus starts growing in your nervous system, leading to encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, and it can eventually kill you. So that's why you got a measles vaccine. Not because you didn't want to get the measles. You didn't want to get the possible persistent infection after the measles. Do not technically classify as persistent because you do not get the initial acute infection. You just, it's just a much slower raise if you're talking about something like HIV. HIV is one of those weird infections that doesn't even really fit on the normal graph that almost every other viral infection fits on. Okay. How you guys feel? Huh? Not real good? Okay. So here's what I would like to do. All right, we'll end right here today. I'll give you guys a chance to ask questions because I want to have time to talk about prions. I think they're cool. <laughs>